September job numbers are out. Do the storms have an effect on those numbers? There's a different kind of Hurricane Harvey hitting Hollywood, and it's getting political. And California gubernatorial candidate John Chung is here to discuss his campaign for the state's top office. It's Tuesday, October 10th. All that and more. Welcome to The Political Beat. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Hey guys, welcome to After Buzz TV's The Political Beat, the millennial show and podcast, breaking down the latest in Washington politics and news from around the country and the world. I'm your host, Drexel Hurd, the semi, like we say, semi-moderate voice right, of semi. the millennials. Uh -huh. uh, you can follow me on social media at Drexel Hurd. And I'm Chelsea Galicia. You can follow me at Chelsea Galicia. I'm the lefter of the left voices. Very, very oh, left Jesus. of the leftists. But that's okay. That's why we like each other. Just some housekeeping items. Um, next week, Texas Senate candidate Beto O'Rourke joins us to discuss his campaign and his seat to hopefully unseat Texas Senator Ted Cruz. Uh, first up on the show, we'll start with the interview with Treasurer Chung. And then in the breakdown, we're going to talk about what the Trump administration is doing to women's rights. And uh, we'll spotlight a breast cancer organization because it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month that's helping millions of women across the country. But first up, while 2018 is very pivotal, Chelsea, we Absolutely. talk about it every week. Uh, for federal midterm elections across the country, across the country, uh, gubernator gubernatorial candidates. Try saying that five times. I know, fast. right? Gubernatorial candidates are vying to be their state's leaders. Here in California, we've got a slate of incredible candidates, from Gavin Newsom to Delane Easton. Uh, to Anthony Villa, Villa, now you say that Antonio name, Antonio Villa, 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 Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and here to talk a little bit about his campaign, he's the sitting state treasurer and uh, of our great state of California and a Democratic candidate for governor. Welcome to the show, Treasurer John Chung. Very excited to be with you. Welcome to the welcome to our studio. Yeah, We're yeah. just talking about how. Icelandic it is in here. <laughs> well, it's I like the political political beat. I like the way you're moving as that, we start yes. the show. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so let's get started on just a few questions. Just full disclosure, uh, one more time, like I always do, because we had Eric Bauman on a few weeks ago. Um, I'm a delegate to the California Democratic Party, so um, and I'll be voting on suggested nominees in February at the state's convention. Um, so let's get started with some questions. All righty, now. This is a very serious question. <laughs> I want to know why a former high school mathlete thinks he should be governor. Well, I want to do my first grade and fourth grade in uh, junior, uh, junior year uh, geom uh, geometry uh, professor proud. The, uh, well, <laughs> the, uh, you know, I, I'm passionate about uh, upward and economic and social mobility. And so when you just think about the everyday struggles of Californian students, uh, those who are homeless, mothers, uh, it, it involves math. It's about, you know, it's just not numbers, it's money. It's about what opportunities do we provide. And here in this great state, the lo our largest economic engine in the United States of America, one in every five of us lives in poverty. And so I want to make sure that the state does right by its math. We know that we were in a financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and we really jacked up the prices on those going to UC, Cal State, community colleges. So I called out the former governor, I called out the former legislature, and so it's important to get the math right. Speaking of calling people out, you are not afraid of being unpopular. Uh, when Schwarzenegger was governor, he wanted you to cut the pay of, um, who was it? Uh, Public servants. Right, 200,000 of them because there hadn't been a, a budget that was passed. And then uh, you took it upon yourself to cut the pay of legislators when they didn't pass a budget. What makes you so unafraid to be unpopular? Because you have to stand up for everyday Californians, right? I'm thinking, you know, there, there were teachers who were receiving pink slips that you saw on the shows, individuals who, were, who required uh, tanks to breathe, they needed the access to the oxygen, and we were pulling back those services because we couldn't get the numbers right in uh, Sacramento. And so somebody has to stand up and fight for them, and so that's, I'm proud to do so. Uh, uh, speaking of Governor Schwarzenegger, who kind of put California on an economic decline back then, um, you uncovered $9.5 billion in waste, fraud, and abuse. That is like worthy of I mean, repeating. $9.5 <laughs> billion dollars in waste. Yeah. Fraud and abuse. And we talk about, uh, you know, we talk about fraud, waste in government, in federal governments, and that's where everybody kind of knows, you know, where, whether or not we're wasting millions of dollars on... Uh, billions. Mil billions of dollars yes. on military spending and, and other things. Um, how does that kind of loss happen in a state like California, and where does 
does all that money go? So I'll give credit to where credit's due, but I'll give you an example. So the Los Angeles Times identified some public officials in the city of Bell who were engaged in outrageous compensation packages. The top five making compensation packages over four million. I went in and did the audit and identified all this corruption, identifying misuse of public dollars. So today, right, they're fixing their budget. They had borrowed, this is an income that has a uh, median income of less than $32,000. A lot of immigrants who are trying to climb the ladder to better places for their, themselves and their families. And so I went in there and put in better practices and they're improving their finances today. Monies that could be used for parks and recreation and public safety and firefighters. That's what you do with those dollars when you when you handle it properly. So then what is your plan as governor to kind of, or what make your sure. plan would be as governor to kind of combat all of that, to kind of work with cities to kind of make sure that we kind There's of avoid $9.5 $9 billion dollars out there. Waste. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm aggressively going to do. The uh, I want the practice where, where you have the state controller, the... Uh, the, you know, the legislature's auditor, the state auditor, when we get those audit findings, I'm going to have a liaison in the governor's office to make sure that we follow through on those audit findings, right? You don't leave those findings in a hard copy when we know we don't use hard copies on the shelves or left in the computers. We want to make sure that we actually take action and improve those finances. A dollar saved is a dollar earned. We could, you know, I want to take down student loans. I had legislation uh, that Ben Allen carried for me to those individuals who had graduated in massive student loans. I want to use some of that money to help them refinance, create a backstop so they can get out of debt sooner than they are today. Wow, sounds great. And I love this quote that you said. You said, it's not just about the numbers, it's about values, where you put the money. And as executive director of the Financially Fit Foundation, Excellent. we talk a lot about putting your values in your, in your budget. And I just wanted to know what you thought of the current budget. What does it say about our values, and what would you change if you well, could? Well, number one, we got to invest more in education. We know that we have so many bright young folks who aren't getting access to early childhood education. Uh, we know language abilities. Uh, you know, young kids are capable at seven and a half months old. The in America, we don't speak enough languages. The you know, we're, most of us only speak one language. So we're going to have to change that. So what do we do to help cognitive development for kids? Age? from zero to two. What do we do to make sure they get that language access at three years old? And so I want to make sure that we have widespread early childhood edu education available. And so that's my top value, education. And I think something that people don't immediately think of when they think of early childhood education is that that's actually, in a way, criminal justice reform. Exactly. Because you're stopping the pipeline sort of at the beginning. Exactly, right. Um, I just want to kind of go back to the education piece of it uh, in terms of your platform, in terms of what you're putting out there, because Delane Easton was former superintendent. How does your plan uh, for educational growth in California differ from what Delane might be putting out there? And Because she's kind of framing herself as the educational candidate and kind of wanting to reform education. Yeah, I think part of it is actually understanding how, how to handle, again, the finances, the finance education. When we had that crisis in 2008, 2009, I had to take the tough action as reference. I had to hold back tax refunds for 23 days because the state was short of money. So what's different is my financial expertise to make sure that we get money into education so that we can invest in uh, early childhood education. And what I would also push is to make sure that we drive a lot of those more resources into lower income, lower opportunity communities. We know those studies from Stanford and Harvard and others that identify if you take a child from a lower income uh, opportunity community and put them in a higher opportunity community or a higher wealth community, they perform the same. So my As the kids that they're going to school with. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so what I've done for the last time, 19 years in public service is investing resources, uh, so it's just not money, but it's education, talent, knowledge, access to people, access to experts to help drive the opportunities create the opportunities to transform people's lives. But are we talking edu pumping money into public education or as the Secretary of Education would have it uh, into online charter schools and charter schools? Oh, the, uh, I would drive it into public education. The, well, charter schools are also uh, public education, but we want to make sure that if we go forward with charter schools, and some of them are incredibly innovative, we want to make sure that they're accountable, that they're transparent, they're not subject to the conflict of interest, and unlike what the Secretary of Education is doing today, uh, investing in underperforming schools and using private vouchers. I don't want that in California. 
Um, so you tweeted that you fought for years to keep our community safe by ensuring California is not vested uh, in what I like to call the terroristic group, the NRA, <laughs> or gun manufacturers. Are, they, are there any other industries that you feel um, that are important to keep us out of? Are there any companies that you would not accept campaign donations from? Well, I haven't taken any money from tobacco companies. I don't take money from oil companies. The, uh, I want to make sure that, you know, that this, this is a state of incredible innovation. We are the pace setter. We're the state of hope and aspiration. We're also the, the forefronter of economic activity. And so we have between 500 and 550,000 jobs in the clean and green space. I've been working in the clean and green space. Uh, I've gone down to... T Dallas, Texas, press protested Exxon Mobil and their shareholder pra or their uh, practices using shareholder rights to challenge their denial of climate change. I've been pushing to get more people of uh, diverse expertise, those with climate change expertise, women, people of color, members of the LGBT community to sit on corporate boards. Because CalPERS and CalSTRS, of which I am a member, owns half to 1% of every major corporation. We want to change America's future uh, when we bring everybody together, when we put the best talent in the right places, right, our future uh, is, for those who can't imagine it, it's going to happen. And I think that's the very core of California. So are you, I'm sorry, just, which one, just to want to follow up on that real quick. So are you really, um, has your campaign focused on the grassroots, uh, you know, in terms of getting grassroots money? Because we know that that's going to be a huge part of um future politics, yeah, uh, they, particularly in this campaign. I've always been about grassroots. The, uh, <coughs> I grew up, uh, well, actually, after I moved from law school, the, this was uh, the San Fernando Valley was the first community that I resided in. I got started off uh, volunteering for the Chatsworth Recreational Basketball League, the San Fernando v Valley Chinese Cultural Association. Uh, was a, a volunteer on Big Sisters of uh, Los Angeles Advisory Council. I believe uh, you know, my passions today in public service are vested in what I did in my youth and my young adulthood. Awesome. Um, the Disclose Act was signed over the weekend, so now we're going to know the top three donors of these commercials that we're seeing more explicitly than, you know, America's for Americans. Americans for, I was making up one of those silly <laughs> names. Americans for that prosperity. They, right. <laughs> right. Um, do you think that the money in politics is worthy of major concern? What would you do about campaign finance? Yeah, it's a corrupting influence, uh, very clearly, right? Here you have in politics today people going to the top 1%, right? And so they have disproportionate influence. Uh, we, we had the big financial crisis in 2008, eight nine. It displaced millions of Americans. Uh, you have Wells Fargo engaged in action where they are open up accounts and there's right no accountability. I was the first statewide elected official in the United States of America to take action against Wells Fargo, uh, eliminating or suspending the top uh, three lines of businesses that they do with the state of California. Uh, but you'll see others who won't call them out, right? Because you'll have those big industries pouring in tons of money. We need to call leaders out and say, why aren't you ch uh, challenging those practices in America that are hurting everyday working Californians and working Americans? Y here you have people right out the street, you know, working every day. They, some of them can't, can't be banked. They are unbanked. We need to change those practices. Right. Um, while we're on money and politics. Oh, yes. Well, I love this one. Well, I mean, well. This, this, this is, topic. This is, <laughs> while we're on money and politics, um, we're going to talk about Harvey Weinstein later on in the show. Democrats have taken uh, not as much money from Harvey Weinstein as people like to make it seem like. What do you make of, what is your position on political donors who give money and then have then create all these problems for candidates that they support. Uh, they have to be held accountable, right? You, you have to call out bad behavior. And when, you, when that behavior is systemic, when it becomes cultural, right, we need to change uh, in uh, how people behave. You know, much credit uh, to the bravery and courage of the woman who stood up, right, who put their careers, you know, in peril, uh, especially earlier, right? The good news is that and the good thing is you had all these people come out and stand up and say that behavior is despicable. It's detestable. It can't be about who we are. And we need <coughs> our big leaders, right, because you see it in the community. So it's not just the big Harvey Weinsteins. It has become prevalent around society. And so we each have an obligation. We each have an opportunity to call out this behavior to change uh, practices that have become too widespread. So then what do you tell your Democrat, what do you tell Democrats across California who might have, say, taken money from Ed Buck? 
and how do you chant? What, what do you say to everybody? And uh, and what do you say? What do you give that money back? What is that like? What is what are those conversations like? Uh, return that money, or actually go use that money uh, donated to a better cause to address those issues. Great. Um, something that we know that is very big in California, SB five sixty two, uh, healthcare is a defining topic of any Democratic candidate. It's probably, as Bernie Sanders would say, a litmus test. Um, a majority of Californians support uh, some sort of single-payer system. Uh, the state party endorsed Senator Laura's bill, and Speaker Rendon has sent it back to committee to find uh, funding. Um, where do you stand on health care, and do you see a fiscally responsible way to accomplish single-payer health care or some sort of universal health care in California? Yeah, so I am a strong and longtime proponent of... Uh, Univer access to universal care that's affordable. Uh, with the current system we have in place, it's expensive. Uh, it's the tons of waste uh, in the particular system. I support single payer uh, because I think we can help when we aggregate all the participants. We can drive down insurance costs. We can drive down pharmaceutical costs. Hopefully, we'll improve delivery of care. Uh, single payer. The question is uh, in under uh, 562. Is it going to be comprehensive or is it going to be more like Medicare? Are we going to limit the access to services? My mom up the street uses Medicare, right, and th it's limited services. If we do all in, we have to figure out how to find out, find $106 billion. That's a staggering figure. Uh, so the question is, you know, how do we use it efficiently? How, we, how do we tie in the services? Give you a sense, $106 billion additionally to cover all of single payer if we did it universally is almost 90% of what we collect from general fund revenue taxes in the state of California. Did you say one, how much did you say? 1.6? Uh, uh, 106, 106, 106, 106 billion dollars. I was like 1.6. Well, you got 9.5 billion. <laughs> we, we could fund. We could fund single payer right now. Um, yeah. So. I, I, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the difference between universal health care and single payer health care. How do you explain that to Californians? Because it seems like you're kind of interested in both. You know, we're either for single payer or we're for universal health care, and we know that they are very different. Um, so, as you're traveling across California, you hear people saying, "I want single payer," and then you're saying, "I want universal health care," and I or or that I'm for both of them. At some point, do you feel like you have to make a decision on which one you support? Because I mean, it's a hot topic, and I know people are going to ask, and we know that, for example. A majority of the delegates are going to ask that same question: Where do you stand on single payer? And I know that's going to come up. So, um, do you think, do you believe that single payer is the way to go, over universal health care, or do you believe that the legislature should just make that decision? Oh, I think we can do both, right? So, t today in California, have we have 2.9 million Californians who are uninsured, and so we can figure out what we can do and how much it's going to cost to try to cover the 2.9 million Californians today who don't. But over the long term, I support single payer, right? The big question is, are we going to continue to collect about $80 billion from the federal government or s uh, under President Trump and the Republican Congress, Congress's proposal, are we going to see a significant drop, right? If you look at that House proposal, we're looking at an annual loss of about $6 billion at least, right? Those projections on the Senate plan over the next 10 to 15 years, a loss of $138 billion. That changes the entire calculation uh, from a financial perspective, whether we can, how much services, how much coverage we could provide under single payer. So then just, I just want to kind of wrap it up on this point, because I think that one of the things that we try to do in the show is kind of educate people on how things work. How do you explain that to people across California? Like, here's the reality of the situation. We want to do X, Y, and Z, but we've got X, Y, and Z as standing in our way. How do you merge that realistic approach with that, the realistic aspect of legislating and governing with the idea of, hey, here are the ideas. We want to make sure that we're putting forth the best ideas, and here's how to achieve them. And But we have X, Y, and Z in the way without seeming pessimistic. The, uh, yeah, you know, great things uh, aren't easy, right? You have the visionaries who articulate, we're going to get this done, and we'll simplify the message, right? These are the three hurdles that we have to overcome. We have to figure out, you know, how to p find another 50 or 80 billion dollars, right? We have to figure out how, how much delivery of care we're going to provide. And we're going to tackle what we're going to do with the pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies to identify, identify the savings, right? Three major areas. Great. 
All right, I have so many more questions. So I want to know, like, if we could all be healthier if the food was better regulated, but we know that that, yeah, whatever. Okay. Healthy communities? Yes. Okay. Community gar There's so many things. Okay. But turning now to community colleges, you want Governor Brown to sign AB 19, which would allow for one free year of community college, not for everybody, for people who qualify for uh, financial aid or are a dreamer. Why do you think this is a good way to go? Oh, actually, if I could, I get the first two years, right? The, uh, right, but the, the le uh, legislation has the first year, right? C community college, we know that going forward, today we have about 32, 33% of Californians who have a bachelor's degree. We know going forward, uh, the decades to come, we're gonna need about 60% that have uh, some type of post-secondary degree. So high school plus a certificate or so, uh, some specialized training or bachelor's degree or advanced degree just to keep up with the jobs. We know that today people are struggling, the incredible costs of housing and transportation. We don't want the young Californians to lose access to higher education, especially when it's critical, it's incumbent for their success. And so I think the state and the cost of community colleges, the tuition and fees isn't all that much, right? So we ought to step up and say this is an important value we, we have to say as a state, we're all in on our students' education. I've never heard it put that way, that there are going to be a lot of jobs in the future that we're not going to be able to, to fill unless we get an educated population. I think when you come at it from that approach, from like, this is actually an economic issue, c community college, I think you'll probably get some more fans of it <laughs> because I know that there are a lot of people that it's like, it's all about the economy, how does it impact the economy? And uh, I had not thought of, of that relationship before. And not even over the long term today, right? One of the things we want to do is we want to hold those manufacturing jobs. Uh, so, you know, we can build bridges from high school to community colleges, right? They can share courses. Perhaps they'll get some credits for community colleges. And as these uh, manufacturing jobs are thinking whether they're going to stay in California or not, right, we can provide immediate training, work with the faculty senate at the community college to get the life skills, the training, so that they can work in their local communities. That's uh, critical not only for the long term but today. Um, so just I just want to um, on uh, on funding for education. Uh, there, I was just posted something from CNBC yesterday um, that said Brown University was raising 120 million dollars to eliminate student loans. Do you think that the that colleges and universities, particularly public and private, un Brown's a private university, public and private universities also need to step up to the plate to kind of facilitate some of that because it seems like I mean Brown's been doing a pretty good job of eliminating. I, I think I read like only almost 100% of people leave with like $8,000 in debt out of Brown at, as they're continuing this plan. Is that something that you can possibly reach? Is that something that you think that both sides would be interested in um, from a public and public, from a public education standpoint? Yeah, I'm gonna be the state's ch uh, chief cheerleader on that. Uh, par part of that is, right, you wanna recruit the businesses that are here that have benefited. Uh, we have a lot of technology transfer when you think about you know, two number one public universities, uh, you know, in the United States of America are here. The University of California, yeah. Los Angeles. <laughs> and Irvine, and Anteaters, <laughs> Zot Zot. And, and Cal <laughs> Berkeley, right? And you think about the hydrogen cars and things that they're de developing at, uh, at UC Irvine, right? We're, we're providing that seed corn. We're providing that basic research. You know, invest back into those local communities. Those are the clusters that create the greatness uh, in individual lives, but also in economic growth and activity in the state. Hmm. Um, another topic that's come up in the past week is, is the Republicans and this administration's continued attack on LGBTQ Americans. Um, from what I understand, you were for marriage equality long before Gavin Newsom. Um, even attended the wedding of Democratic Party Chair Eric Bauman almost like two decades ago. Um, what's going to be your focus as governor on protecting LGBTQ Californians? Yeah, they, I've done it on so many different fields. So, uh, at the Board of Equalization, I created LGBTQ financial and tax seminars. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we remedied some of the prop property tax law that had unfair discrimination. Uh, when California moved forward with our own laws, I wanted to make sure that we could try to reconcile the differences between state tax law treatment and federal tax law treatment. I give a lot of kudos to the Franchise Tax Board staff who work really hard to reconcile a lot of those particular activities. Uh, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I pushed to, to get more LGBTQ uh, members on corporate board of directors, right? Because it can't be just public leadership. We want private sector leadership. We want to create communities that support those rights. Uh, that's how you push back against backward, bigoted thinking in Washington, D.C. 
All right. All right. A totally different subject, but one that is really important to me. Um, infrastructure, because I think any moment now, the big one is going to hit. <laughs> and uh, there was a quote by you. When you were asked a question about California's infrastructure, you said, I'm terrified. Terrified of what? The, uh, I'm concerned that you know, we don't, we're not taking the appropriate action. Uh, we don't have a proper design of what, how to address infrastructure. Uh, in my biannual report that I put out last year as the state treasurer, I proposed a framework by which we think about the state's assets, right? Because we're, we're disconnected. We don't have a central inventory of all the state's assets. Wow. The, we should have, the state needs to do a better job of asset management, right? Here you have a lot of unused uh, properties, right? Perhaps we could use it for workforce housing. We yeah. could use it for accelerators or incubators. We could use it for nonprofit senators, parks, recreation. And so I said, let's look at all the assets, aggregate it, look at the useful life, because you don't want more Oroville dams or you don't want those bridges like we saw in uh, Minnesota a couple years ago where it broke down and it cost, we lost lives. Uh, so, and then I wanted to create a center for financial excellence so that we can help, especially smaller jurisdictions, think about how to finance this, aggregate projects, lower borrowing costs, and then move forward as to how we move all of this to make sure California has the best infrastructure. If you don't have good infrastructure, you're a third world economy. Right, and so your fear is more about the, f the future investment plan that there isn't, none. not that the infrastructure is so terrible that we're all going to die in the big one. The, uh, well, we have to be careful. Well, not yet. We're not, we're <laughs> not going to die. But, you know, we lost lives up the street in Northridge right. uh, during the <coughs> 94 earthquake, right? So, and so, you know, we responded, but we, we understand that uh, we witness broken pipes, we look at broken sidewalks, you look at the homelessness. We have a lot of infrastructure work to do in the state. Um, I just a couple of last minute, a couple of last questions. Um, it, on your website, jongchang.com, that's C H I A N G.com. Very good. Um, your website has a lot of great information about you. Where can they find, like, I remember going to Hillary Clinton's website and it was just pages and pages and pages. And, like, I loved Hillary Clinton, but I mean, I was like, there's a lot of pages here. <laughs> um, but what, where can they find, we talked a lot, a lot about on the show, uh, on the show so far, where can they find your plat, where can they f just straight out platform, boop, 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 here's where I stand on this, 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 and this, and this, because right now, if I, I mean, I'm on the website right now, yeah. uh, where can they find that information? We're going to put it up uh, shortly. Great. And then before you go, we're going to do a little trivia game. Ah. But this, this trivia game is for Drexel, and you're, you, you'll make sure that I got it right. Okay. okay. Oh, I didn't know it was for me. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. One of these is not true about Mr. Chang. Chang? Sorry, gosh. All right. First, number mm -hmm. one, sat on the board of Planned Parenthood for 10 years. Two, you can enter to win tickets to see Hamilton with John. He has been endorsed by Congressman Ted Lieu. He grew up in a home that spoke two languages. Which one of those is not true? Well, I can tell you which ones are true. The Hamilton tickets, because I definitely want those. We are uh, <laughs> <fan>. <laughs> um, um, I know you're endorsed by Ted Lieu, so let's strike those out. Um, I'm going to say sat on the board of plant. I'm going to say you did not grow up in a home that spoke two languages. Uh, actually, my parents spoke more. My That's what, it, yes, my I was hoping that was true, because it's not two, it was like four or multiple. five. So my dad spoke uh, English, uh, Mandarin, Taiwanese, German, I'm missing one, Japanese. And then my mom spoke those languages uh, minus uh, German. Do you speak any uh, multiple languages? No, my, ch my Mandarin is a nursery school level. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Well, listen, um, I think we got a lot. Uh, any last-minute last, last minute pitch, 30 seconds. Oh, no, this, uh, it's been an incredible privilege. Uh, you know, I want California to look like this room. I want people where you have incredible exceptionalism, people of great imagination who are trying to create the future, care about community, and it's diverse. Uh, this room, and I think the state of California needs to send a powerful signal all across this nation back to Washington, D.C., that it works. We celebrate uh, people who have great heart, who have great spirit. For those who have lost trust, who have lost faith, don't. Uh, if you need a place, we are here, and we're going we're gonna to build a future that is uh, simply the best. 
Awesome. We'll leave it right there. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Treasurer. Thanks My for pleasure. coming My down own. to Southern California. Uh, we definitely look forward to watching you on the campaign trail over the next few months. And I'll see you in San Diego in February. Perfect. <laughs> um, like I said, you guys can check out uh, Treasurer Chung's website at www.johnchung, C-H-E. It's so, it's so confusing, N right? We're not the only ones that get that wrong. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that are like, I don't know. Thank you for guys for coming in. But you heard it here, Chung. Heard it here, Chung. We got him first, I think. Maybe not. We'll see. We can tell that we story. Can, we'll tell that story every every time, every week. Um, just a couple. Down. Well, just a couple of quick things in the headlines, because I, I do want to talk about a couple of things that, that happened over the next over the last couple of weeks. For, uh, yesterday, or today, the EPA rolled back uh, the President Obama's historic clean power plan um, with uh, Scott Pruitt, the EPA director, declaring that the war on coal is over. The war on coal. Uh, I, I would like to think that it was the war on keeping people alive. The war on death. The war on death. Maybe that's what Democrats should start framing it as, the war on death. Yeah. Uh, listen, this, this kind of sucks, but I think the, the momentum of clean energy is picked up such a pace that the reality is this coal will kind of try and come back from the dead, but it'll just whimper and die. Yeah. Um, also, last week, the job numbers came out with about uh, 70,000. This is the first time in seven years that there was a job loss in the economy, that we saw a job, that we saw a net job loss in the economy. Um, a lot of people are saying that it was because of the recent hurricanes. It was about 40, 30,000, 30 to 40,000 private sector jobs that were lost. Um, so I, I, have a, I have a little bit of problem with people. With, what with was the logic behind the hurricanes? Causing jobs. That people couldn't get to, to work and that people that a lot of companies went out of business. But I was like, that doesn't really make any sense. If it's thirty thousand private sector jobs, those jobs aren't lost. The people just aren't going back to work just yet. I mean, like Macy's got hit in and I know because I work for the company, like Macy's got hit in Miami. People still went to work. And there was a lot of companies that did go back to work. So I have a hard time believing uh, people's um Might be small justifications. Businesses that they're Maybe, of? but seventy thousand jobs in small businesses seems excessive, especially when we talk about the $30,000 in private sector jobs hmm. so that were lost. Um, and at least 15 dead today, uh, California wildfires in Napa. The area had some 20,000 people evacuate and Governor Brown declaring a state of emergency. Um, I know, <laughs> I, I saw some, something on Facebook today that, that was like, when is Donald Trump going to say something about the, the, uh, the fires in California? And I had to be like, he did. Like, I, I felt like I felt dirty defending the president. <laughs> what but did he say? He just was he first of all, he called Governor Brown. Uh, so it's not like the president's not aware. Um, but he also brought it up during the NHL, you know, when they do that big photo op at the White House with the championship uh, Stanley Cup winners, the Penguins. Uh, and uh, so he brought it up then, along with multiple other things um, that he talked about um, whatever Donald Trump talks about. But he did bring it up. So uh, President Trump said that he spoke with Governor Brown uh, and that the federal government is monitoring the situation. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Now we're moving on yeah, to we're moving. the breakdown. Yeah. Uh, last week, Trump administration and Republicans continued their attack on women's reproductive rights, rolling back Obama-era regulations requiring most employees, employers to provide their employees with birth control coverage without co-pays. This mandate had helped millions of women avoid unwanted pregnancy by eliminating out-of-pocket costs for contraception. Chelsea. Yes. As a woman. Yes. A woman who uses birth control. A woman who uses birth control. What do you, what do you make of this? Well, the, the reason I'm a little bit of a different story, I'm self-employed. So for me, when um, the ACA went into effect, my uh, premiums went up, but they probably were going to go up anyway um, because now I needed to, the plan had to include maternity and, and birth control. So that was great because if I had not, if, if the ACA had not covered that, I would have had to pay $1,000 out of pocket for my preferred method of birth control. And that's a kind of a, a chunk of change. I mean. Granted, you know, my premium went up, so eventually somehow I sort of paid $1,000 in there um, anyways. But I still think that this birth control is to, so important to leave in there. And it is discriminatory to women. And if anybody says that this is like a re um, religious um, reason, it doesn't make sense. Because if, you, if an employer provides 
birth control, it doesn't mean that the employer who has the religious belief has to use them. And I know that this, you know, opposite logic was used in the Hobby Lobby case. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the court got it wrong. And because of Hobby Lobby, um, this might stick. So can you explain, as a woman who uses birth control, other, because I feel like the religion, I mean, I, mean I'm, I feel like guys don't understand Obviously, mm -hmm. clearly, males don't quite understand the need. I mean, we liberals like me, like we obviously support women's rights and things and, and, and things that they need. What for folks that might not understand, what else? What are some other things that people use birth control for? Well, you know, regulating periods, skin problems. There's a whole host of things that, you know, normalizing or having some kind of impact on our hormones will change a lot, mood even, all sorts of things. So that's totally correct that it's not just about pregnancy. And I, I want to, you know, if this is going to be true, I want it to also be true that like employers no longer cover Viagra or something for some right. reason. I'm sure there's some religious reason against, you know, artificial erections or something. Why do you think, see, I find it interesting because I, I am really interested in knowing, and maybe it has happened, why women's groups have not made it a life or death argument to pro-lifers. What do you mean? Birth control. How, do you, how would they make that I just that meant argument? like, they seem to be making the religious argument like it's birth control stops. It seems to me that they're making the birth control, religious people make the argument that birth control stops pregnancies from happening, blah, 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 blah. I think actually I've heard that they believe that it kills, kills life. Kills, right, kills life. So I, I mean, I'm going to assume, and maybe this is just I don't the think male logic. science, you know, supports the idea that it kills right, life. Right, it doesn't. It, it prevents it from happening. But this is kind of interesting in light of last week's announcement about this um, child, with pain-capable abortion um, bill that right. they're trying to pass. They've been trying to pass it. Because he, he, this is what occurred to me. Um, who was it that announced it? Lindsey Graham? Yes. Over Which is over, crazy. Over and over he was saying, the science says, the science says, the science says that at five months or 20 weeks, a fetus can feel pain. And I'm like, really? Now you believe in science? Right. Um, can we talk about the science of climate change? Or because you're not an expert, Scientists, you can't speak to either one of them. You you can't talk out of both sides of your But we know that Republicans only believe in something if it helps their argument. That's I mean, the this, reality of that's, the situation. This situation right. kind of supports that. Um, I, I, I don't think that it, most people are going to believe that it kills life to stop a of pregnancy from occurring in the first place. And if you really want to cut down, if you really, really, really do want to cut down on abortion, why not provide birth control? Right. And if you, your religion doesn't allow you to take birth control, you don't take it. It's kind of like sex ed. Like, if you remember that argument where Republicans would say, we shouldn't teach sex ed in schools? You want to cut the, it's, it's like simple logic. I mean, it just sounds simple. Yeah. You want to, you want to decrease the number of abortions. Like, we talk about this all the time. There is nobody that is pro-abortion. No Democrat, no actual person is pro-abortion. Nobody's saying, yeah, 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 let's go have an abortion. Like, that kind of logic is uh, untrue and unreal, and if you think that other people think that... You're disconnected uh, you're, from reality. You're, right, right, right. You're, you're out over there with Donald Trump and, and Little Corker. And uh, <laughs> Little, L-I-D-D-L-E, -L -E, as he called him today. Um, and, but the other side of that is... Um, Wait, what was I talking about? Sometimes that happens. Sometimes I'm in this thing and I just like completely black out of what I was talking about. Um, I don't know um, either. But um, anyway, so yeah, so I find it really interesting that Republicans are making this argument. And that's why I said at the beginning, that's why I asked the question. Okay, the question was, do you think having used birth control, because there's a lot of people that say, you know, birth control kind of, say, you know, if I didn't have it, there would be lots of problems for a woman, mm -hmm. if I didn't have birth control. Is that, I mean, is that a life or death situation in some cases? Can that be a life or death situation in some cases? Oh, I'm sure that doctors and scientists could find situations where it is. But I think the, the more important aspect is 
how the the burden of unplanned pregnancy on a woman um, is is significant, and if Republicans want to cut public assistance and don't want to cover all these kids with health care, I, I just don't understand the logic of you want to force somebody to have a, a, a kid and not be able to, if they're Pay not... Pay for them. A, right. <laughs> um, That's why I was... Sorry. What I was saying was, why wouldn't you want to teach sex ed in schools to, to help mitigate unwanted pregnancies? Right. This is the That's only the time logic. where they're not thinking of the economic argument, and I think they almost should. Right. That the cost to prevent an unwanted pregnancy is so much lower than the cost of supporting a child that but is born. But do you think that sometimes the democratic messaging on that needs to shift Absolutely. in terms of saying, actually, let's talk about what you, let's, right. let's balance the econ economic right. weight of that. As of right that. now, mostly we hear about it's a woman's body, it's, you know, she can do right. what she wants with her body. That's true to uh, a large extent. But then there are also other angles, like you're saying, to talk about it, that it might make sense for more people to understand it that way, because they don't buy into it's a woman's body. And right, because all they hear is it's a woman's choice to abort, instead of it's a woman's choice for economic re it's a, there's, there's a lot of choice. There's a lot of things that go on um, in making that decision. But And we do know that making that decision is one of the hardest things that any woman would have to do. And, and it's not birth just because... control makes it so much easier because you are much, much, much less likely to ever face that question if you're using it. And having um, inconsistent access to it or not access at all, I mean, this will, you know, derails people's education and, you know, job path if they have an unintended pregnancy. And I think that if this was tried uh, in court, um, it's going to be argued as a discriminatory law or regulation. Right. Whenever the state discriminates against uh, a group, the court puts, decides what category that group fits in to determine what level of scrutiny uh, that discriminatory act is going to get. So for example, if there is a law discriminating against African Americans, we, the courts have determined that that one is the highest level of scrutiny and the government better have an insanely good reason for that uh, law in order to be constitutional. The discrimination against women, I cannot remember, it's been a while since law school, <laughs> if that gets intermediate scrutiny or the most difficult level of scrutiny, where the state has to make a really significant argument about why that discrimination is necessary and that they have narrowly tailored the law to fit that specific state interest. And I don't see how the, the, the interest, there's not a state interest. The interest that the government here is protecting is the individual private um, right, if you will, of people to push their belief, their religious beliefs, right. on others. Which is <laughs> unconstitutional. Uh, right. So that's why, <laughs> that's why I, I kind of, I want somebody to take this one up, because I don't think it would survive. I don't know. Neil, I, I feel like Neil Gorsuch would look at the words, and he would be very... I mean, but if it, the 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 Ninth Circuit is you know because that's where it would it would start, very liberal. They would provide I'm I'm sure, unbelievably good language right. that Kennedy would buy into. Well, think of it, <laughs> Justice Kennedy, right. or I don't know because sometimes you right. know sometimes we needed he, Justice Roberts to, to, is, to do a couple things. He but, is uh, a conservative. He just sometimes swings the other way, but. Um, so this lot is 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 personally disturbing to me about removing birth control. So yeah, I'm it's it's a little crazy. Uh, watch equally that one. equally as disturbing, uh, Democrats in Hollywood are also dealing with the situation on their own. A Hollywood mogul Harvey Weinstein accused of sexual harassment by several women in Hollywood. Even today, it was like Angelina Jolie and Gwyneth Paltrow and a couple of, and and women all across um, Hollywood. And, and I, 
read an article that this it's not just sexual harassment right. it is downright rape right in some circumstances um just so folks that don't know even if you've never heard his name before um harvey weinstein you've it, definitely uh, seen his movies if definitely you, if you watch project runway you definitely know about uh, harvey weinstein uh he was the head of the weinstein company that produced pulp fiction Shakespeare in love and of course project runway and one of the most powerful men in hollywood until sunday or until last week. Uh, Weinstein has also given about $2 million to Democrats over the past two years. Do uh, you think it's a problem for Democrats? <sighs> this one's a little tough. Because I, if the rules were reverse, if this had happened on the Republican side, they might say, you know, this is a private individual who gave money. It's not a reflection of the RNC. Um, so they would they would deflect it like that, but they were the first ones to come out and point out that he s supported the Democrats. And the other reason why I can't I can't argue that they all should you know give the money back or give it to other organizations is that this kind of um, financial support it's difficult to say that or I don't think believe that that kind of money swayed anything. Right. Like this money does not mean that the politician was then going to be less um, forceful of their stance right. on protecting women. Yeah, I don't, I don't really see that celebrities who give money have any influence on policy unless they, I just don't see that happening as frequent, as, obviously as corporate. I mean, I, I think that's the, couple of things that people talk about in politics. I know we're talking about Harvey Weinstein, but like George Clooney one day said, you know, when people talk about coastal elites, celebrity elites from the from the coast, um, they forget that all those celebrities came from flyover states. A much good majority of, of them, yeah. a good majority of celebrities did not come from California. Certainly did not come from New York, and they have kind of worked their way up uh, to kind of do what they need to do. Um, but you know, I think what people forget that in Hollywood, for women, it's very different. Um, and that they're, you know, they, you know, we all, not we all know, but if you don't know about the casting couch, people know that that was a thing back in the day where women would go into these auditions and then people would sexually harass them for yeah. roles. I mean, it, it happened then. Um, it certainly happens, continues to happen. Um, and it's definitely something that people have to, um, that Hollywood definitely needs to address. I mean, it's it's definitely an issue, but I the the political aspect of it I think is overblown. I know that some people like Elizabeth Warren are taking whatever money he gave to her and Elizabeth donating Warren, to Chuck Schumer, women's causes. Patrick Leahy was the first one to give his money back. Um, and and everybody, the crazy thing about it is everybody was waiting. <laughs> Republicans were waiting on Hillary Clinton. To, As, say to say something. First of all, I think Republicans seem to forget that it was just over a year ago, last week, that the Access Hollywood tape came out. And they didn't bat an eye, really, when it came to uh, helping a sexual predator become president of the United States. And I have come to understand sort of why. It's because many people believe that Bill Clinton is one of those predators. And she's married to him. So... Right, but I think she that, condoned but, but see, here's it. So the thing. we right. should too. Hillary and, and I think Secretary Clinton said, "I was shocked and appalled by the revelations about Harvey Weinstein. The behavior described by women coming forward cannot be tolerated. Their courage and support of others is critical in helping stop this kind of behavior." Um, but at the same time, like I look at Hillary Clinton, and Republicans just last week, you were telling her to shut up. So mm -hmm. either you want her to shut up, or you want her to say something. That's interesting. You can't have. Listen, you could have had Hillary Clinton as president, and then she could have made a statement, and then you could have had that statement on the record. But now, you either want Hillary Clinton to go, or you don't want her to go. Barack Obama had to come out with the statement because um, we know that Malia was an intern at the Weinstein Company. Oh, I forgot about she that. She was a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and so you know, I, obviously, and the, the Obamas came out with a statement um, that they really were shocked. It was a long statement, so um, I don't want to get into that. But yeah, I mean, I agree with you that Democrats. Um, I mean, it's $2 million versus $100 million or, you know, $200 million that the Koch brothers is putting yeah. in, and they're, and they're influencing in, policy. In the scheme of things, $2 million is nothing. $2 million is an ad in, in California. <laughs> you know one, what I mean? Right, you know. one ad. And so 
sure, you can give them, they can all give the money back. It's not going to make any difference because two million, unbelievably, has very little impact yeah. on it. A uh, campaign. Uh, I know we, we just threw up a graphic um, if you're watching on YouTube. Um, Ronan Farrow, Mia Farrow's oh, yeah. son, who you also used to be an MSNBC contributor, uh, wrote a piece from The New Yorker. Uh, if you want to check it out, it's on the newyorker.com. Um, the title is From Aggressive Overtures to Sexual Assault, Harvey Weinstein's Accusers Tell Their Stories. Yeah. And then MSNBC, and I know all the networks, replayed today. I don't know if you heard it. I didn't want to bring it up because it was very, it was, it was, it was a little disturbing. Um, I didn't want to like bring up the audio. It was Harvey Weinstein trying to get a model to go into his room. It was a part of an FBI. It was part of an yeah. entire sting. Uh -huh. And I was like, that shit's nuts. Yeah. Like what he was like. I was like, and I know Tim was watching with me, and he was like, who is that? What is he saying? And I think people forget that he's also married to Georgina Chapman. Georgina Chapman, the model. Georgina Chapman, the fashion icon. She's yeah. very pretty. Uh, she's very successful, and you look at Harvey Weinstein, and you go, how did you get Georgina Chapman at all? Um, and then, you know, at the beginning, she was like, I'm going to stand by him. But as of today, I think they are separating. So oh. um, that is what's going on in the Weinstein world. But, you know, I think the, the more serious uh, thing is that, you know, people have to remember, you know, we, we went through this whole thing with Casey Affleck. Ben Affleck came out with a statement today that was like, Harvey Weinstein, blah, blah, blah. But then you look at Ben Affleck and you go, but you, like, defended your brother. And you're like, what? That doesn't even make any sense. Well, it's his brother. Well, I mean, I get it. But, it, like, it does, like, either you got to come up with a better statement than attacking one person when, you've got, when, you're, when you're close by to somebody else. I didn't read his statement so much as attacking him as, as kind of acknowledging women for what they go through and but then they, why make a statement like, you know what I mean like why make a statement at all because like, everybody is pushing people celebrities to make statements and, and people are getting pissed off that more celebrities male celebrities are not stepping up I to wanna, say something I, I want to know what Matt Damon has to say because apparently he killed a story a few years helped kill a story a few years ago I can't remember who it was with like who helped like who was collaborating on that but like Matt Damon was one of the people that was, that was trying to kill a story. Uh, supposedly along with Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe, that's who it was. So uh, definitely men, get it together. Get it together. Get it together because we got wars on women from the Republicans, you know, and, and we went through this whole campaign last year. We talk about sexism in politics. It's a thing. Yeah. This is not, this is not just, this is obviously this is not just, you know, you know, pigeonholed to, this is not just a, a focus on Hollywood. This is something that transcends politics. This is something that happens all across the world in boardrooms everywhere across uh, the country and across the world. So do not think that uh, because Harvey Weinstein is the subject that it does not happen um, in your workplace because I work with a bunch of women and I know that it does, um, uh, you know, across the board. So um, not not at, hmm. not at my company, but um, I know that it does um, in several different companies. So, um, yeah, so let us know what you guys think of Harvey Weinstein, and uh, if you think it's going to be a problem for Democrats. Um, what is a problem, as we always say, uh, it is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, as we said last week. Uh, we'll highlight uh, organizations this month that you can help donate to in the, to help the continued fight not only to find a cure, but to help families with medical bills. Uh, this week, uh, the Triple Negative Breast Cancer Foundation is our pick. You said that so fast. The Triple Negative Breast Cancer Foundation All right. uh, is our pick. The foundation is dedicated to supporting uh, triple negative breast cancer specific research and to providing meaningful, meaningful programs and services to the TNBC community. I think I brought this organization up last week uh, when I was talking about my mom because she had, was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Um, and I know this was the organization that we, you know, the in lieu of flowers, this is where those, uh, this is the organization that uh, we told people to donate money to. So check it out at tnbcfoundation.org for more information on that. All right. Well, it's kind of a somber note to leave it off on. But, but we had a great guest. That is very true. We'll, leave it, we'll do that. Uh, don't forget to check out the Trump Report following this program. It'll be uh, myself, Chelsea, and Brooke Solis Taylor is back uh, with Christian Blatt. Uh, the Will and Grace after show on Thursday. And get the latest on what to put on your DVR with DVR Daily. Uh, the DVR with the DVR Report, that is daily. 
uh, on AfterBuzz TV. Be sure to follow AfterBuzz TV on all social media to find out when your favorite shows are on. Thanks to gubernatorial candidate John Chung uh, for joining us this week. We definitely extend that invitation to Gavin Newsom. Delane Easton and Antonio Viragosa. Viragosa. Uh, we're going to find you on the Twitter. At Chelsea Galicia. You can find me on at Drexel Heard. We'll see you all on the political beat next week. See you later. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff. We would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.